Hello again, everybody. This is Mr. Everything, and I'm coming at you with another Wargaming Adventure video. In this video, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be painting my U.S. Army platoon, and what we're going to be doing is uh, painting them up like uh, 101st or 82nd glider troops. Uh, I've already put a video out showing assembly. And at the end of the assembly video, I showed that I painted them dark taupe, which is actually a really dark brown. Uh, and I decided that would have been great for the trousers. But what I realized was the jacket should be a light color, light khaki. So I went ahead and grabbed and repainted them all with the Rust-Oleum camouflage khaki. Um, I, I tried this on a couple of figures yesterday as well as uh, another color, uh, Nutmeg, and then the Dark Taupe. And the Dark Taupe seemed like it was the best, but it's actually a really good color for the jump uniforms, the early D-Day jump uniforms, and not the later war, just regular Army infantry uniforms of any kind. So what I did was... Uh, I put that off to the shelf and I went back to the Rust-Oleum khaki. All right, now there's only a few colors, only a handful of colors, because after I paint the jacket khaki, which I did just by priming, uh, there's only a few other colors. Uh, let me count. One, two, three, four, five, and a wash. Six, seven, eight, and a wash. Okay, so there's eight colors and a wash. And so let's go ahead and I've started to use these Princeton uh, brushes, Summit. Uh, it's, it's a round brush. It's a two brush, not a 10-0 or some junk like that. It's two, it's giant. But uh, the reason why this is gonna work for me is because at the end, we're gonna do a strong wash. All right, so let's get started. Uh, the first color we're gonna use is the medium flesh tone from Vallejo. All right, let me go ahead and finish the rest of these guys, and then I'll be right back. All right, now the next color we're going to use is Field Drab. It's a brown for the pants. Let's go ahead and start that. Now, I've switched to a uh, Master Touch brush round 3-0, or not even a 3-0, just a 3. It's a much bigger brush. Uh, mainly because it's less detail work. I am just covering a larger area. Uh, basically just his pants. I'm going to paint down and it's okay if you get it on the on the gaiters because we're going to paint the gaiters later. Try not to get it on the jacket because the primer is the paint on the jacket, and so you don't want to have to go back and touch that up or you know, fix it or anything. So that's his pants. Let me go ahead and finish up the rest of these models, and then I'll be right back. All right, guys, the next color we're going to use is red leather. We're going to actually use the red leather for their boots. 
Uh, now, I'm using a big ass brush, a four, uh, and as a technique, it's not a technique, <laughs> what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna paint the bot under the gaiters and the boot. And I don't care if I get it on the gaiters. Again, again, the gaiters are still to be painted. And if I get it on the base itself, it's perfectly fine because that's going to be covered with gravel and then grass. There you go. Simple enough. Now let's go ahead and let me do all these boot bootes and then I'll be right back. All right, now the next color is I don't use a whole lot of Tamaya colors, but they do make a few that are really good. And one of them is the Olive Drab. The Olive Drab is like the perfect color from Tamaya. All right, now on these models, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit up their helmets and only their helmets, just, just knock out the helmets with this Tamaya Olive Drab. And you can see it covers really well, and it's a really dark olive drab, and that's exactly what we're looking for. All right, let me go ahead and finish painting these guys, and I'll be right back. And just temporarily while I'm here, not only do I want to paint the helmets with the Tamaya, but I'm also going to paint the bazooka barrels and the shells. All right, so we get the bazooka done. All right, let me finish these guys up and then I'll be right back. All right, guys, the next color we're gonna use is the Burnt Sierra. We're gonna use this Burnt Sierra on the wood furniture. And on this model, the only thing I can get to is the stock. But let's take a look at, all right, so we're gonna take a model that's got an M1 Garand, and we're gonna paint all the wooden furniture on the rifle itself, which is the main body of the, of the rifle as well as the buttstock. Taking care not to overpaint the hand 
for the sleeve. Or any of the fingers, I should say. But we're also going to touch up the T-handled entrenching tool uh, post because it's actually a wooden uh, entrenching tool handle. Alright, so you're going to get the entrenching tool handle and you're going to get the stock of the weapon uh, and that is burnt sienna. Yeah, burnt sienna. All right, let me go ahead and finish these guys up, and then I'll be right back. All right, now the next color is actually U.S. Gators Brown. It's like a, it's a very light color. We're going to go ahead and use that on the actual gators. All right, so we take this guy, and... Now the gator should be fairly easy to paint. Because the pants are over the gaiters and the gator line lines up right against the boot. All right, that's one gator. All right, and then you get the gators just like that. Now remember, this is actually quite bright, but we are, remember, going to be using a strong tone at the end to ensure that everything is brought down. All right, so let me go ahead and finish everybody's gators, and then I'll be right back. All right, guys, the next color we're going to use is not the khaki webbing. Uh, I thought khaki webbing would be the perfect color for pouches and backpacks and things like that. But uh, after using it on a test model, I realized that it is way too light for the backpack and the belt pouches and the canteen covers. It's just, it's just too, too light. It's, um, it doesn't match any of my uh, World War II gear that I actually have. I actually have a whole World War II paratrooper uniform with backpack and everything. And that color was just not doesn't match. So I've decided to use this green ochre, which I've been using for years uh, for World War II backpacks, things like that. I was just second guessing myself because Warlord had a, a paint called khaki webbing, but that's, it's just too, it's too light. You can kind of see the difference there. So this is what it would look like using the green ochre. And that brings it down to about what I need it to be. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and use the green ochre on my model right here. Now he has a butt pack. A canteen cover. A map case. Get the underside of his canteen and his butt pack and the other side of his butt pack looks good and then we're also going to paint his magazine pouches
leaving his sling and his holster to be a different color. All right, let's just do one more guy. Uh, There's another NCO. Uh, we're going to do his magazine pouches. And he just happens to have two sets of them. His canteen cover. Now, you, you might be saying, Mr. Everything, how come you're not doing it in, like, OD green? Well, in the beginning of the war, everybody was wearing browns, and then they transitioned to a green uniform later in the war. Um, <clears throat> but that rolled out in the Pacific first, uh, in the tropical climates, and then the the temperate climates, like Europe, retained the khaki and the brown uniforms until almost the very end. Uh, and then they transitioned to the green uniforms. And, uh, and you might think of, like, post-World War II, everybody wearing green. And that's true. But during World War II, it was pretty much browns. All right, so that's what we're going to do with all the guys. Let me go ahead and do them all, and then I'll be right back. All right, guys, now the next color we're going to do is saddle brown. We're going to do the saddle brown for, like, the chin straps, and only the chin straps. So this should go by pretty quick because I only have a couple of them with their chin straps hanging. All right, the mortar team's actually got a guy with his chin strap hanging. I'm also going to paint the box he's carrying the same color. And just so you know, the uh, steel pot or the army helmet uh, has a liner on the inside. Uh, so it's really got like this little cardboard liner on the inside. And the cardboard liner, which nowadays is actually made from like a fiberglass, but back then I do think it was made out of cardboard. It had its own chin strap and you'll see a strap that like crosses over the brim of a helmet that's actually the chin strap from the liner and not the chin strap for the actual steel pot So what I'm painting here is the actual steel pot chin strap. With this saddle brown. And not all of the not all of these helmets have the chin strap hanging. Okay, so let me go ahead and finish all the chin straps, and then I'll be right back. All right, now the next color we're going to do is gunmetal gray. We're going to do that on the metallic, like, weapons and barrels and things like that. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and paint on the Thompson here.
All right, now let me go ahead and get all their weapons, and I'll be right back. All right, now our next color is going to be the khaki webbing. I'm actually using this on the slings and maybe some straps that I might find on their torsos. All right, now on the officer here, the main thing is his Thompson sling. And then I might put a my color a little strap on his bud pack. Uh, now he has the uh, a strap cross across his back. All right, now let's go ahead and finish the straps on all the other guys, and uh, then I'll be right back. The next step in this painting process is to use the Army Paints Quick Shade Strong Tone. Uh, dark Tone is just way too black, and the light tone isn't thick enough. Uh, now, this mixture here is actually not 100% Strong Tone. What it is, it's a 2 to 1 ratio. I put 30 drops of strong tone and 15 drops of water uh, now the reason why you'd want to thin it down is to let it flow better but also uh, so that it doesn't get too thick or too dark you just have to uh, experiment with your consistencies is it going to be thick enough is it is it not thick enough is it too thick uh, and then you figure out what works best and what you like the best on your models, but I think I like the two to one ratio. Uh, now, you just when you're when you're putting the wash on the model, make sure you just apply a really thick coat and make sure you cover all the model, right? You you don't want to leave any of it unwashed. Uh, and once the and you can see like on that backpack how the straps and everything kind of are enhanced the gaps between the legs show up a lot better uh, what that's going to do is it's going to make that model look like uh, you did all this fancy painting uh, and you really technically you let the wash do all the work for you uh, it'll also bring the colors that you used uh, they'll it'll darken all the colors you use that's why sometimes i'll use a lighter color than what I anticipate in the end, but that's okay because um, it'll darken it down. All right, and you're putting it on thick because you want the wash to actually settle down into all the different cracks, but you don't want it so thick that it that it becomes. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, intrusive. You want it to be thick enough that all the cracks and all the seams in your fabric and everything really pop and stand out, but you don't want it to be caked on there where it's disguising the details. All right, so let me go ahead and finish washing these guys. And if my 30 drops of wash and 15 drops of water if it winds up not being enough to do all 30 models here, or 33 models, then I'll just go ahead and mix some more and finish. All right, so 
I'll see you once these are done and dry. All right, now we're back. All the models are finished. The uh, the wash has dried. We've got a good texture and good color. Uh, highlights are done. This is these these models turned out really well. We went ahead and started doing the gravel on the bases. Uh, I did want to say that some people ask me like what kind of gravel I use to fill the bases in uh, as my base coat for the flock. And I use Woodland Scenics Fine Ballast Brown. This is, uh, I don't know, five, six dollars. And what I do is I take that and I pour it into a Tupperware like this. And that's how I take my figures and I dig them or I'll sprinkle from here. Uh, and that gets me that result right there. All right, now the next step is to put the uh, battlefield grass on there. Uh, let me go ahead and get that positioned. All right, now as you can see, I've got my Elmer's glue. I've got my tester's paintbrush that I use to do all the grassing on. And I usually have a couple of extras of these. I save these and I keep them in my uh, on my modeling shelf so that if I ever need any just simple boxes like this to hold figures, I'll have them. We're going to use Battlefield Grass Green. Um, I put that inside one of these boxes. Anytime I do any flock, I either have a box of flock or I'll have a tub like you just saw a second ago. Uh, and then from there it's prepared and then I'll take PVA and I don't water it down or anything. I just take it straight out of the Elmer's bottle. And then what we'll do is we'll take the Elmer's and I'll put two or three drops of Elmer's on here. You, if you watched my Fallschirmjäger video, you'd see this very same technique. And then I take the brush and I push it down using the flat side of the brush. I kind of stroke it like that. Uh, so you'll see it get pushed down into the rocks. But I do use kind of a dragging motion to get the Elmers to cover a larger area. Now I'm only trying to cover about a 75% of the base, allowing the fine ballast to shine through from the bottom because it'll look like there's dirt underneath the grass. If there are any larger stones uh, that I either add manually or are mixed in with my ballast, I try not to put any of the flock directly on top of that. And then I take a couple of fingers and I sprinkle the ballast down onto the figure. And it's going to only stick where the wet Elmer's grips the flock. But to ensure I got good coverage, I will cover the entire base. And I will actually allow it to maybe get two or three layers thick. Basically just a mound of flock on the base. And then I'll sit the figure off to the side and allow that to dry. What happens is... The Elmer's glue has sits on top of the gravel, and when you drop the flock on it, it actually just sticks to the top of the glue. And if you were to shake it off immediately, you would have very thin patches of flock. But I want it to be thick where I put the glue, so I allow uh, time to allow the the flock to soak down into the glue so that when it dries, it'll have a good grip on it, plus it will be th thicker. Okay, so we're going to let that dry for a few minutes, like 15 minutes before I start shaking it off. But while we're waiting, I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of these, 
and then we'll be right back. All right, so we're going to go ahead and knock the flock off. And you notice I have it in a slightly larger box. It's one of my boxes there. So if I miss any flock, if it misses the tub, it'll go right in this area. You can use the brush and knock any excess off. I tap, give it a little brush. And then we got it just like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock all the flock off of this. And then we'll do a real close-up shot so you can see how these models turned out. All right, I'll see you in just a minute. All right, now here is the whole platoon, complete, finished, flock, everything. Now uh, we've got our three eight-man squads, one with an NCO, one with one NCO, one BAR, assistant loader in every squad. I got the lieutenant here. I've got two bazooka teams, a medic, and a medium mortar in the back. Let's go ahead and take a close-up look at each of these models. And let me adjust the focus so we can get a close-up look on these guys. All right, so I'm just going to bring up some notables. Like here's the lieutenant. One of the NCOs. See the pants? How that wash got into each of the creases and seams? And how it highlighted the backpack straps and stuff? I even put a little bit of the wash inside the helmet to make it look worn. And how the wash highlighted individual cases in the magazine pouches. cycle through these pretty quickly just so you can kind of see them. Uh, I do want to point out that it took me one day, uh, maybe about two or three hours, to do the assembly. And then it took me one day to paint these models with this technique that I showed you. And then it took me probably about 30 minutes to put the gravel and the flock on all of these. Maybe an hour. Yeah, an hour sounds appropriate because I had to wait for the gravel to dry before I shook it off and then I had to wait for the flock to dry before I shook it off. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool, whatever those glasses are. I'm super happy with the way these guys turned out. I don't know about you. Brown pants, khaki shirts. And then a darker color for the backpacks and not, and not the straps. I used a khaki webbing on the straps. Got the grease gun with him loading it. I thought that was kind of a cool figure. I had to do that one just because it was unique. I did brown handles on their K bars because they have like leather wrappings. I have a K bar on the shelf over there, so I know exactly what it looks like. Closer so you can see that. Packs on the ground. Mortar looks a little dirty because of the wash. The wash did that on top of the OD.
ないだっけアプリシエイユーカムンアウトテイケンアルクエットマイペインティングオブディーズインフェントリーディスイジェスト・ユーエス・アーミー・インフェントリーバンマイ・ティーム・ワーズ・ユーズ・ムズ・グライダー・トゥープスヤフィンティー・トゥーン・ドウ・ウィン・ウィン・ニーディゲット・フューモー・トゥー・フィル・アップ・グライダーズ・アゲット・フューモー・ペア・トゥーブス・フィル・アウト・Now, I thought about putting Flock on some of their camo nettings just to give them some camo. But I can always add that later. All right. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.